uh, after rabbit right. hole, right? And so I'm fighting that too. Mm-hmm. And I mean, honestly, half the time was just me falling away and being like, ooh, I wonder when that happened. I wonder when that, like stuff that I wasn't going to use. But I ended up, you know, I ended up in these tangents spending 30 minutes reading about something when I'm like, oh, wait. I got like I got something to do. I'm doing something. What, man? Stop that. But you need to know some of it. Some of it the backstory was pretty important. Even if we don't have it like written down here, you needed to know what was like what what drove that decision and what made right. that happen and uh, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And so I don't I don't necessarily regret it uh because it was yeah, there's a ton of stuff that was that was there that ended some of it ended up in the show. So great, but oh could yeah. have done without it. <laughs> I know. Would have been fine. I know. But no. Coming up in this episode, the origins of the shirts, Ubuntu's history, and some thoughts on 2204. Hello and welcome to Linux User Space. I'm Leo. And I'm Dan. Dan. Yes. Dan, you're looking fancy. Why? What's oh you got a bow tie and I, everything I know. and a little yeah, a little got, tux insert a little, too? Little, little tux guy and this 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 little you know thing over here, the trident. Wait. That's is a, that the BSD, that's the a trident. Beastie Trident? That's a trident. Yeah, absolutely. Is that is that from the Beastie? I think so, yeah. Oh, so I got this shirt um, because I was a remote attendee at Southeast Linux Fest self mm-hmm. and um, I paid a little extra, got the shirt too. And I, I watched some of the, I uh, watched several of the uh, presentations. There were some that were, were super great. Probably even a few from people you might know, Leo. Uh, I don't oh. know if you um, know Mark Ulmer. He brought a Windows uh, laptop to a Linux uh, oh. uh, festival, but it was did, good. Did did that cause any waves? I know, I know, I've seen Macs, and then there was a whole like news article about there was a Mac here. <laughs> yeah, no, he explained his choice and talked about a lot of different things and ways to still be able to use Linux, um, but yet have have a Windows laptop. So did so did he so he softened the blow with like, well I run WSL on this or something. He did talk about WSL, <laughs> you know, I knew it. virtual machines are an option as well. Yeah. And the different virtualization platforms and whatnot. So um good choices. Yeah yeah, yeah. It was it was it was clickbaity title, but a good, good <laughs> presentation. So cool. And I noticed that you're, you know, you're very cool today wearing, Ooh, wearing the, I'm groovy. the groovy gorilla guy. I'm feeling very groovy. Um, yeah, this, this one is in, in honor of today's show. Uh, this was a shirt that back in, what is it, groovy gorilla? What was it? 20, you, I've been looking at this so long. I probably should know. What is it? 2110? 20, 20, 20, 20, 2010. 20, 2010. Ah, it was a 10. I knew it. Mm-hmm. And. There was a little contest uh, because this was the first version of Ubuntu that was uh, that was given the thumbs up to run on a Raspberry Pi right. four, right, right, and the desktop, the desktop to run on Raspberry Pi four, and so they were they were looking for people who were running Raspberry Pi four with Ubuntu twenty ten, and I just happened to be doing exactly that. Because uh, I was testing whether or not Audacity and this uh, audio interface and some other gadgets was actually going to work for me as a studio box. Because that's a, that's originally why I bought mm-hmm. the Raspberry Pi 4. And turns out, yeah, um, web browsing. When all that stuff was going on, web browsing took a pretty big hit. Mm, but yeah. if I had a script in front of me... Uh, stuff was already written, and I was, and I wasn't, you know, opening up multiple pages or anything like that. It would have worked absolutely perfectly. But uh, Chromium, Firefox, you know, the options at mm. the time, a uh, little sluggish when you got like twelve tabs open and also doing all of that stuff. Um, but 
uh, and you know, one of the one of the little things, and I, I took so much pride in it. Nobody said anything about it, so I was like, oh. But uh, I had I had recorded something and then put the cursor on Audacity mm. uh, right at twenty minutes and oh, 10, ten seconds. seconds. Nice. And nobody noticed. Wow. Well, but it was that's, fine. That's 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 a hidden Easter egg. Well, that that's the thing. I love putting Easter eggs in like all the things. Mm-hmm. So like you, you do. go back and and watch these shows. Like there's Easter eggs all over the place. There's little things that pop up and show up. This guy, this yeah, guy right the, here, the little monkey guy. He shows up Easter a lot. Egg. He shows up a he, lot. He is in every single thumbnail mm-hmm. that we have ever had, and. No one's ever said anything about it. where's the Lars this time. No well, I I look around for it and I well, Dan, you do. I but know I to look for you, it. You though. know, yeah, yeah. you know. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so I love I love Easter eggs, and that was one of them. But anyway, so I really like this shirt, and and I hope it lasts as long as my utopic unicorn shirt mm. has, which is fourteen ten ish. I think probably I'm probably right on that one. Probably. Um, but it was because it was a unicorn, man. And that was also around the time that I bought the the Ubuntu backpack, uh, yep. which is over there. So I love that backpack. It's such a good backpack. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. A lot of people raved about those. Yep. They're, they're, yeah. Yeah. It's just, they're just really, really good backpacks. I have some trouble with the zipper now, but I think I'm just going to get that repaired instead of like sure. getting another backpack because it's a zipper. How hard could that be, right? Should be good. Well, okay. Harder, harder for me. Then I'm sure someone that knows what they're doing, but how hard could it be for them, right? I'm yeah, 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 yeah. Somebody that does it all the time should be easy. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So one other uh, quick announcement, actually, not uh, this shouldn't take too long. Lubuntu uh, has decided to do a little backporting, much like the uh, Kubuntu backports. We're now offering the latest LXQ for 2204, which we're going to be talking about Ubuntu 2204. Whoa. So now, now you can get the latest LX Cute um, 1.1 and your 2204 uh, LTS. Wow. So, so, so if you want the latest and greatest on the desktop on Ubuntu, your only options are QT bases, it sounds I, it, like. It, it seems that way, yes. Mm. Uh, well, no, Mate, Mate has a, a testing repo, I think, as well. Um, and they might backport some of the some of their stuff uh, mm. there, too. Um, okay, now that I didn't know. Um, but that might be a little hidden, and it's not as advertised as ours. Right. Well, okay, that makes sense then. Mm-hmm. Um, because uh, Kubuntu and the, the backports, PPA, and all yeah. of that, like, that's... Um, it's in your face. They remind you of it all the time. And I'm I'm grateful for it. So, I mean, one of the things that might possibly, that, that could happen and has happened in the past is sometimes uh, the version of Qt gets a little, um, it, that, that is in the LTS will get a little old. And so then it makes it harder to backport things. Um, but that's much much later along in the progression of the LTS, not not yeah, early that, on. That has so. been a thorn in neon side for a while, and I suppose. So then you got to backport cute too, and, and right, and we're not we're not prepared probably to get all of that backported. So uh, we'll, we'll okay. ride it as long as we can, and I think that's pretty far. So yeah. Look well, for- I mean, if you're if you're already riding the backports, then I imagine getting an uh, getting onto an interim release wouldn't be too bad. Well, you can you can probably easily get the two years out of it, which is by the time the next LTS is coming, right? Um, but you, but you might not get the full three years or five years or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, three years. Right. That's right for for Lubuntu for sure mm-hmm. and Kubuntu as well. Yeah. Yeah. So don't don't ride it the full three years. Ride it for two years. And you'll likely be just fine. Then go to the next LTS and you'll be fine over there too. All right. If you haven't uh, subscribed to us on YouTube, uh, please do uh, jump on over there. We'll have a click, you know, we'll have a click in, in, in the show notes where you can go and, uh, and jump on over to the channel and please do like comment and subscribe. Yee. Normally, you can watch us uh, live on Twitch the day after an episode drops. But due to scheduling conflicts, uh, we're going to have to cancel the next one. Sorry. No. All right, Leo. 
you've been it's... preparing for <sighs> three months for this show. Uh, and you know, it, honestly, so this is going to be a full on saga. I, I took I took me a break for sure, but um, this was a time commitment to go back and look at the Ubuntu history, and I think the reason why it was it, it was such a big undertaking was because they actually chronicled it. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, we have. I, th- I think a lot of the distros that we've had, like a lot of stuff, gets lost to time. Like, not even archive.org scraped that website while it was alive so you know that stuff is just lost the time and if wikipedia or somewhere else didn't capture it then you know you gotta you gotta hope somebody knows about it somewhere and well there there has been some stuff that ubuntu has kind of lost i guess but it was chronicled in so many places that you know nothing was ever truly lost yeah so there was so much to go through, and every time I found something, I was like, ooh, got to add that. Ooh, mm-hmm. got to add that, too. Oh, yeah, that's that's important. That's that's really big. So I had to put some, I had to put some blinders on myself. Uh, I said that anything that was specifically only server stuff, I would try to only put, like, you know, very little of that right. in just stuff that, you know, affected me personally or I thought was really, really important or something like that. But, you know, outside of that, uh, I'm going to try and focus just on Ubuntu as a whole and the desktop. Desktop, yeah. So, with that in mind, come with me to the land of Linux long, long ago. Okay, it wasn't that long ago. It was April 2004. In April 2004, uh, I couldn't find an exact date on this, but uh, Mark Shuttleworth, without any public announcement, it was very hush-hush for a good six months from this point. And you'll see why, six months. Um, but he invited Debian developers, and, and he was, for a time, uh, a, a yeah, he was a Debian developer or uh, yeah, maintainer. Right. Yeah, right. A, a mm-hmm. contributor, maintainer, yeah. yes. Um, and actually enjoyed all of that. But mm-hmm. anyway, so he invited a bunch of Debian developers to his flat in London to lay the groundwork for what Ubuntu would become. And it was to be shipped within six months. There's six months. Mm-hmm. And there was a, a quote that I found on a couple different places, but uh, basically goes... We'll get this out in just six months, so it'll be a bit of a warty warthog. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, keep keep that in mind. So they became, and and this was a story um, that that was told by I believe it was Scott James Remnant, where they were all in the in the flat in London, or they were all together multiple times. They all came into the same IRC channel with the same IP address, and mm. eventually they got dubbed the Super Secret Debian Startup. But soon after that, because of Mark's quote before, they dubbed themselves the Warthogs. And they were, forgive me for any mispronunciations, Lamont Jones, Martin McLemare, Jeff Waugh, Michael Vaught, Colin Watson, Mark Shuttleworth, Tom May, Robert Collins, Matthias Close, Scott James Remnant, Fabio Massimo Donito, Matt Zimmerman, David Harris, and James Troop. It, it, it's real interesting because some of those folks are still very active in Ubuntu. So, yeah, keep keep an eye for some of those names and you'll see them. Yep. So they set out to make a distribution that was community-driven, right? Mm-hmm. Community. The very first thing, the very first thing on the list, community-driven. Had a reliable release cycle. I mean, look back. Yeah, yeah very, it's very reliable. Almost set your clock to it, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Good localization, uh, good accessibility. Python as the main programming language, an ecosystem for developers, and of course, ways for regular folks to give back to Ubuntu. The The idea around this time for Launchpad was also born, but it wasn't called Launchpad back then. It was called Soyuz. Uh, Shuttleworth financed... All of the work paid all of the developers full-time salaries. And six months after that meeting, October 20th, Ubuntu, 
the distribution was both officially announced for the first time and Warty Warthog 4.10 was released using the GNOME desktop and 32-bit live disk uh, alongside the installer disk. And they planned 18 months of support for this guy. Shipped with kernel 2.6.7, right? Think way back, 2.6.7, and GNOME 2.8. Pretty close to the uh, the release of Wordy Warthog. Ship it was available, and Dan, you and I know oh, yeah. this... Um, initiative, I would call it. I guess like ship it was fantastic. Um, I remember. I, I mean, I have some around here somewhere. I probably should have grabbed them. Oh, um, <gasps> you have some still. Um, yeah, I think I do. I think I have a couple. Oh, um, I'll, I'll, I'll see what I can do about digging it up. But like, um, you basically you ordered CDs or DVDs or both, and then they would ship them to you. Um, and like we got a bunch at work and started handing them out to other university students. So, you know, to try to encourage them. And this was at a time when, you know, there was a transition in, in, in windows. And so some people mm -hmm. were getting, you know, the viruses were really full on, oh. right? The worms and all of that stuff. And to get away from that, a lot of people were looking at Linux as an option and having it like they didn't have to go to the internet to download it or burn it or any of that stuff. Uh, you could just hand them, hand them the CD or the DVD and away they went. It was an important piece to mm -hmm. the puzzle of getting Ubuntu adoption. And I mean, at least from where I'm sitting, it looks like it worked. I think maybe Five or six, two thousand five, two thousand six is when I started buying or buying. They weren't. They no, weren't. They, to they shipped them. They shipped them to you. You didn't have to at, pay at cost to Canonical. They I just know. shipped you like a box of fifty. So yep. yep, yeah, it was so cool. That was the coolest thing about it. It was free to people, and so distribution was just. I don't know. I don't know how they ate that cost. Literal distribution. It's a good thing Mark Shuttleworth was a millionaire, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so 2005, right? Let's let's keep going. April 8th, Hori Hedgehog 5.04 is released, and I didn't know it was this early. KDE was added, but as a flavor, Kubuntu was born. Yeah, very early, yeah. On this release. So, I mean, Kubuntu is almost as old as Ubuntu itself. Mm -hmm. the, the, the first 64-bit and PowerPC discs came out, uh, on this release, and it was the first release to allow installation from USB, which was pretty unheard of at the time, just in general. Yeah, that would I have mean, been USB like one one or whatever at that point. Yeah, probably, right? and and a lot of these USBs were like sixty four megs. Oh yes, yeah, so, small, small. Right. So I mean, you had to have the right kind of USB in the first place, like those one gig ones. Um, you, you paid a little extra for that mm -hmm. much storage. I remember thinking, um, man, these, these flash drives have like more than a CD now. Wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, so shipped with kernel 2.6.10 and KDE 3.4. By the way, Ubuntu has, uh, all their releases. They're just there to download. They are. Um, they are. And so I fired up pretty much all of them. And Wow. What a blast from the past. Nice. <laughs> anyway, July 1st, the Ubuntu Foundation is created because you got to pay people. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, Canonical and the Ubuntu Foundation and all of this stuff has to be funded, has to go through something, has to, right? And so with the mm -hmm. initial $10 million by Mark Shuttleworth, um, it started. It's also the first time that we see five years of support for servers but only three years of support for the desktop. Primary goal of the, Ubuntu, of the Ubuntu Foundation is to ensure the high quality distribution of free and open source software is available free of charge throughout the world. Then in October 12, Breezy Badger 5.10 is released and another flavor is born, Edge Ubuntu. Well, it went away and kind of came back. Yeah, uh, this distribution is aimed at ed the education sector with uh, educational communication software. It also brought uh, server support 
and Kubuntu introduced a new package manager, Adept. Hmm, not Discover. Adept. Mm -hmm. The DVD version of the ISOs is introduced, right? You just can't jam pack all of that stuff on one CD anymore. You got to make a big one. And that's what happened. Mm -hmm. And on the main version of Ubuntu, the Ubuntu logo finally makes an appearance on the applications menu. So if you think back, if you remember what GNOME 2 looked like, you had the, the applications, places, and I think it was system maybe. Um, yeah. But on applications, you always had an icon there. And right. up until now, it was the GNOME foot. Right. But now it's the Ubuntu, I guess, humanity logo, human logo. The circle of friends. Ah, that's the one, Circle of Friends. And it's shipped with kernel 2.6.12. On April 30th of 2006, Wardy's 18 months are up, and its support cycle has ended. In a month and one day, Dapper Drake 606 is released. That doesn't sound right. Wait, what? Say that yeah, again. already, already, right? Uh, so this was the only release ever, ever, cross your fingers, right, that it doesn't happen again, but ever <laughs> to fall from the April-October cadence, but for good reason. It was the very first, the announcement, right, the announcement of the support, yep. the very first long-term support release that was going to get its five years. Mm. So it had to be right on launch oh, if you're yeah. going to tell people take it and we'll support you so it had to be right and scott james remnant dubbed it instead of lts long-term support he dubbed it late to ship hey they got it right so that's the important thing you know what late better late than never uh especially if you're going to support it for five years right the live disc so prior to Prior to this release, there was a separate live disk that you could run, you know, right, pop it in, run, run without having to install it. Uh, that was separate. It was a separate disk that you had to download. The installer disk was a separate one, but you could install from the live disk. It just didn't have everything uh, that the installer disk had. So the live disk was merged into the install disk. So now mm. it's just one disk. If you download it and you plan on installing with it, you'll also get the live environment too. And... The Ubiquity Installer. Oh. You, you know this one. Zubuntu. Join the family with the XFCE or XFace. I don't know that yeah. one either, but yeah, the yeah, XFace yeah. desktop. Uh, and there was a shift on the main Ubuntu installation. There was a shift from brown title bars to orange. Mm -hmm. Kernel 2.6.15 and XFCE was released at 4.3.90.1. That's a lot of dots. August 10th, the very first point release of the very first LTS was released. So 6061 mm -hmm. came out. And on October 26th, Edgy F 6.10 is released. Now with more upstart. Yep. Yeah. They dropped. SysV and it replaced it with upstart. And well, I mean, we we kind of know, right? I mean, most folks that's know fairly controversial. System D now, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but they stayed with Upstart for quite a long time. What's funny is that um, most people think Upstart is dead. It is not. Don't tell anyone. But Chrome OS still uses Upstart. Still to this day, the day you're hearing this now, they use Upstart. That's so, wild. That's wild. I mean, and and. This this is pretty much every project that, that gets, and I'm air quoting here, abandoned yeah. by Canonical. They never die. They, they never die. It's like someone finds that to be the perfect use case for them, and then they just keep using it mm -hmm. forever. Yep, that's true. All right. So the automated crash reporter, uh, and, and another one, I, I don't know if it's Apport or well, App, 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 App Port. Yeah. A, A Port. Okay. Yeah. Those, App, App, App Port. Cool. Makes its debut, right? This is the little thing that pops up whenever, like, the thing crashes, right? And so you can send information to yeah, whoever. Like it does all the canonical. little log connection on, on the backside and, and uploads all the appropriate things based on the package that you are you are filing the bug against or what has mm -hmm. crashed. And, uh, yeah, it does all the bits. 
Then a few days later, April 19th, Feisty Fawn 7.04 is released. It came with KVM support. See, I said I wouldn't give you too much server stuff, but here's some. KVM support. Comp is desktop effects. Mm. You can easily rotate the cube in this release. Yeah, buddy. Easy Adobe Flash. Remember when Flash ruled Ugh. the world? We didn't have HTML5 and JavaScript everything. It was Flash. Flash was the way to do fancy stuff on the website. And of course, when MP3 support was still kind of controversial. Mm-hmm. Because old Fraunhofer, mm-hmm. the uh, the the what was it, the trademark or the licensing, the reg- yeah, whatever, light, yeah. yeah, hadn't hadn't like basically expired. So it it there was a toggle. You had to like, yes, I I'm totally in a country that allows me to install this. Of right? course, I am. No, nobody in the U.S. actually read any of that. We just said yes, but it was not like you couldn't do that. You shouldn't do that. Shouldn't. Shouldn't. Couldn't. Shouldn't. Yeah. Uh, You know, it depends on what day you catch the RIAA, right? (laughs) I mean, that's when. (laughs) Anyway, uh, also better NVIDIA and ATI. Driver support, ATI. Before ATI was gobbled up by AMD, Mm -hmm. they still made video cards. And it was, anyway. So ATI driver support and shipped with kernel 2.6.20. Dell, on May 1st, you were like, oh, they totally started with the Sputnik. No. Dell was probably one of the they first were. They were. manufacturers to to just jump on the Linux train. And Ubuntu was absolutely one of the first companies, or Canonical was one of the first companies that they started making deals with. And 7.04 started shipping on Dell devices back then. Whoa. Yeah, that's cool. May 13th. A little bit after Feisty Fawn was released, the first release of Ubuntu Studio, which is obviously still around. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, if you don't know what Ubuntu Studio is, it's a multimedia product distribution, right? So if you do audio, video, you know, the stuff we're doing, all yeah. of that stuff, if you want the tools already baked in, the, the correct kernel chosen for you and all of that stuff, you want Ubuntu Studio. October 18th. Gutsy Gibbon 7.10 was released and had a separate server disk as well. It introduced App Armor. Mm. Uh, we still use that one today. We do. NTFS 3G. Uh, lots of people still use that one today. I think we have better kernel support for it now. There was that whole controversy with will they, won't they update it in the kernel. Yeah, but, that, that yeah, was recent recent conversation. Yeah, yeah. They, they they got back to it. It's it's fine. So so most of us have gotten rid of NTFS 3G, but it, it debuted back in, uh, back in 2007. The Flash installer for Firefox to make that easy. So, you know, YouTube works and all that stuff. Right. That was an easy couple clicks. Firefox got Flash. You're good to go. And Go Ubuntu. I didn't even know this was a thing. Oh. Go Ubuntu makes its debut as a fully free and open source version of Ubuntu with GNOME that has the stamp of approval of the FSF. They don't have that stamp anymore. <laughs> well, no, but... Yeah, no. And alongside that, then you reminded me <laughs> of Mythbuntu. And it makes its debut. Did you use it back I, then? I, I did use Mythbuntu. Um, I, I had one of those, you know, Hapaj, um, you know, oh. video capture cards. That was the TV yeah. capture card thing. And basically you turned your, your box into a, a DVR, which, you know, um, that was a thing back then. Like, yeah, yeah nobody well, was yeah. recording TV shows, and it, well, there was certainly this is right around TiVo time, right? Like where TiVo was it, a. It was close thing. to TiVo time, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And but like, um, better than TiVo, obviously, you still had a Linux box, so you could do yeah. do stuff with it, like Firefox and things like that on on the big screen, if you will. Um, I think I had a 32 inch uh, CRT TV that uh, all of this was attached to. So you can imagine uh, the the great high quality resolution that that was providing. Oh boy. Not, it was before 4K, trust me. So, 
And so all of those, Gobuntu, Mythbuntu, Ubuntu, Kubuntu, uh, oh, I was about to say the L one, but that's not Not yet. yet, Not not yet. Not just yet. Hang on. The X X one, though, the Zoo one, uh, shipped with kernel 2.6.22. Then in November 27, Launchpad is officially released, which brings us PPAs. Mm. I I can't really live without a PPA. I, I know the OBS Snap exists, but I'm I'm more of a PPA guy as mm-hmm. far as that particular package goes. So I mean, you know, hey, did the last live stream on the PPA OBS? What, what can I say? Well, um, yeah, I'm using uh, Kubuntu's PPA for the backports. <gasps> mm-hmm. and, oh, and, the mm-hmm. and, and so that's pretty fantastic. But uh, beyond what the end user gets to use uh the developers use them a lot as well true um so certainly building packages and making sure they get built against um current you know things that are in the archive or building up a whole entire stack and then copying that into the archive like all of those are things that ppas are allow um developers to be able to do nice so a little bit later, 2008, February 26th, System76 joined the fray with laptops, desktops, and servers. I did not know System76 was this old. Mm. That that was surprising to me. That is surprising. It, it makes a whole lot of sense. I mean, they, they know their way around a laptop these days. March 5th. Landscape. I told you I wouldn't give you too much server stuff, but it's kind of important because it affects the desktop a lot. Yep. Uh, system management and monitoring tools for Ubuntu launches. Then in April 24th, Hardy Heron 804, another long-term support, is released for both desktop and server. I liked this one mm-hmm. because it came with Wooby. Mm-hmm. I remember Wooby. Wooby was my favorite thing because I didn't really fully grasp how to like multi-boot back right. then. Did anybody? And uh, Maybe, <laughs> probably not. But <laughs> Wooby made it easy. Mm-hmm. It reminded me, so back in the day, I remember Mandrake had something very similar. It was like, it was like Linux to DOS or I don't remember what it was yep. called. But, and it, it allowed you to install Mandrake within the FAT32 partition of your existing Windows installation. Wooby is the same thing, except it's in TFS. So Wooby allowed you to install Ubuntu within your Windows NTFS partition without actually messing with your disk. It still installed Grub, and it still gave you, like, you know, Grub today, where you choose, you know, Linux, Windows, whatever. And it could still break. Right, oh, yeah. like if well, Grub is Grub is there and it doesn't know where anything is at, you're like, well, I can't boot nothing. So you'd have to go <laughs> fix it, sure. But you didn't have to start messing with the data on your disks to be able to make right. room for a Linux installation or anything. And if you didn't have a second disk, you didn't really have much of an option. So Wooby was fantastic. This is how I ran Ubuntu for the longest time because I was always afraid to get rid of... I, mean, I, think, I had the key and everything, but, you know. I think a lot of people did. I think, I don't think you were alone with that. It just made it easy. So you just, it was a couple of clicks um, from what I remember in, in in Windows, and it ran an install program, and, you know, th- there it was. Yep. It was it was fantastic. I mean, that's that was my Ubuntu experience, so mm-hmm. absolutely. And Pulse Audio, by default. Wow way back then again Mm -hmm. another surprising like i didn't know it was around for this long but obviously it was um kernel 2.6.24 we still we keep creeping up and these are actually the same like jumps in kernel evolution but the you know the versioning is different nowadays yeah anyway um however later on Found out that 704, 710, and the current 804 was all were all affected by a serious bug in OpenSSL that uh, allowed someone to kind of predict the random numbers that were Ooh. spit out of the random number generator. Right. Well, that's kind of a problem when you're generating. I don't know encryption keys. <laughs> yeah, which are very random. Right. Yeah, not so random. Not if you can predict them. Not random. Yeah. So 
anyway, they had to go back and fix that. Um, but, you know, even if you were on any of those particular districts, as long as you updated, you were fine. But if you were, you know, isolated away, yeah, you probably should update. Anyway, June 3rd, the Ubuntu Netbook Remix isn't out yet, but it was showcased at Computex in Taipei, Taiwan. But a week later, Mark Shuttleworth announces the PPA that you could put it together for yourself. So there, there's still no netbook remix yet. But if you wanted to test it out, see how it worked and put it together, you could. And in June 13th, a couple days later, GoBuntu has been made redundant and will merge with the main Ubuntu. And they have, this is why it's redundant, right? They didn't just get rid of it. There was a free software only option in the installer. So, right, didn't need a separate thing for that. A little box box now. Yeah. Easy. A few days later after that, Ubuntu MID, didn't know this existed. What? The mobile internet device version Oh, edition, I guess they're all editions up to this point, based on 804 is released with cooperation from the Intel Moblin community. Images were available for KVM, obviously for testing, uh, and the Samsung Q1U and another for select machines on the Menlo platform, which is basically Intel Atom processors back then were all Menlo, and so you could use it on those particular machines. Uh, But I went to moblin.org, it's now redirecting to Tizen.org, which is, if I'm not mistaken, the Samsung like mobile operating system for not all Samsung. I don't know what it actually yeah, is. Yeah. I remember there was some hype about it a few years ago that it was going to be a competitor to Android. Right. That, and I think I don't, I don't know if that actually happened. I don't think so. Uh, maybe in uh, certain regions. N- not ours. Maybe. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, you know, no, it's Android or iOS around here. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. Launchpad 2.0 is released with a much simpler web interface and, of course, makes it easier to use for both users and developers. So everybody gets to rejoice on this one. Launchpad just gets better. October 27th, Intrepid Ibex. And there's going to be a theme now. Goats. We, I guess South Africa just has a lot of goats. Um, and and I, I know I'm using goat in a very broad way. <laughs> Yeah, but they, you know they're mountain goats. That's what that's what they are. There's gonna be more mountain goats coming your way. So yeah. Anyway, released for the desktop and the server and the ephemeral and limited guest account where everything oh, would yeah. be forgotten is introduced. This is a fantastic addition. I love this particular thing. It's kind of like running live, but not. Yep. So that was fantastic. I loved that. And the first appearance appearance of DKMS to rebuild kernel. So if you use something like VirtualBox, yeah, this this helps you out every time anybody has an upgrade in the in the stack yep. of that. Yeah, yeah, yep. builds dynamic kernel modules and shipped with kernel two dot six dot twenty seven two thousand and nine, April twentieth. John T. Jackalope, and there's there's a whole myth mythos of jackalopes around where i live so you know this this was this is pretty near and dear uh to me uh for desktop and for server uh, a fresh new u splash boot screen Mm. so when you're booting the yeah says ubuntu it's all nice and pretty and stuff not just a bunch of text scrolling by right 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 now we had some of that, right? I mean, even even Warty Warthog get a had bit. Get like a, a splashy bit. thing. Yep. But now it's just fancier. Mm-hmm. And now there's on-screen display for volume, brightness, Wi-Fi. You know, connected, not connected. Up, 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 up. Down, 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 down. You know that. Um, those little displays that pop up at the bottom of your screen. Those right. show up. Uh, native ports for ARM v5 and ARM v6, and all shipped with kernel 2.6.28. July 9th, the first attempt at user-generated wallpaper is to be included with Karmic Koala using Flickr. So it was the whole community, hey, y'all, we yeah. need wallpapers and stuff. Submit your favorite wallpapers and get them into us. Add them to Flickr, and then we'll take some of those, the best of those, and put them directly into the distribution. Mm-hmm. And just more community stuff that I think once that happened, 
realize the response they got, it just kept happening over yeah. and over and over and over again. Again, community things, right? Like, Yeah, absolutely. I love that kind of stuff. Then on July 21st, Canonical Open Sources Launchpad. I mean, you can't say no to something like that. Just goodwill all around. Uh, June 1st, the 100 Paper Cuts project was announced, focusing on fast to fix and annoying bugs. Kind of like KDE's current project, right? Now the that where they're where 15, they're fixing the 15 minute bug initiative. That's the one where you can find the bug in 15 minutes, right? It's similar, not quite the same, but if it's an annoying bug and it doesn't really take too much effort to fix, that's what we're going to focus on. So starting June 1st in 2009, that's when that starts. Uh, I got a couple extra links inside of there talking about uh, all of that stuff. So if you want to read more about that initiative, which still continues on, you can see uh, how it started, how that all got going. October 21st, we have to shed a tear. Mm. Not, not a full tear yet, but a little tear. It's the beginning of the tears. Yeah, we gotta we gotta turn it on just a little bit ahead of the karmic release. Ship it is toned down. Well, I, I would say like CD burners were a lot more prolific at this point too. Yeah, um, and CDs were cheap, ish, relatively. Listen, don't don't ask me how I know CD burners were prolific at this point. Don't ask. Well, nothing. Yeah, nothing to do with my music collection, but at all, at but, all, not a thing. However, um, you know, sorry, Metallica. Because of all of that, uh, it, it became a little redundant even, though, too. Yeah. Then in October 26, Karma Koala 9.10 is released for desktop and server, and Ubuntu 1, the personal cloud service shipped by default, which came with 2 gigs of storage free for everyone. Grub 2 is now the default bootloader. The Ubuntu Software Center, based on Policy Kit, is introduced, and Kernel... 2.6.31. 2010, March 4th. Almost all Ubuntu assets get a new look filled with light. It was, I, I don't know how many posts there were um, on Ubuntu.com, on Mark Shuttleworth's blog, talking about light. It's the light. We got to turn on the light and we're going to add some light to your light theme. Right. Anyway, ahead of the 10.04 release. Mark Shuttleworth had lots of mock-ups looking ahead of what was going to you know, become the new interface. Mm -hmm. It was going to become the theme for GNOME first and then Unity. They later renamed it to Ambience or Ambiance? Ambiance. Ambiance, right? Um, so yeah, light, lots of light. It's coming to you, right to your face. Light. Mm -hmm. Then on April 21st, Ubuntu and Dell team up for the Moblin Remix Developer Edition on the Dell Inspiron Mini 10V. That's a that's a mouthful. Yeah. Um, I didn't I didn't really see much about Moblin after this. Yeah. I'm just gonna assume it shipped on that device and then never again. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe never again, yeah. It quite possible, quite possible. Anyway, on the 29th of April, Lucid Lynx 10.04, another long-term support release with the Windicators, right? Uh, I don't know how serious that was, but I kept seeing Windicators here and there. I don't think anybody actually really started calling it Windicators, but anyway, the Window Indicators. Okay, and what that means is the X button, the Maximize button, and the Minimize button, right? Those are on the left now. And Ubuntu got a lot of flack mm -hmm. for putting them over there. Mm -hmm. A lot of, I don't know how many different uh, articles I read about, they're trying to be like Mac. They're trying to be like Mac. And it's like, like, where are you going to put them in the middle? If they're on the right, you're like Windows. If they're on the left, it's like Mac. Where are you going to put them? You can't put them anywhere. Those are the only two options. Well, no, you okay, could be maybe, like maybe, elementary and, and take them right out. That's true. You, just, you get what? Well, I guess in GNOME 2 now, is you get what? It's just, X. Just that's it. Poof. Gone. Windicators on the left, the new ambiance theme uh, with light and dark title bars and panels. Radiance was the actual light theme, which is weird, but whatever. Um, there weren't 
uh, many, many folks that were just kind to this release, at least the way that it looked. Um, and here it is. I was waiting for it. I was counting down the years. Lubuntu makes its first appearance here, but it was like a little clandestine project. Little where bit. they 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 didn't ask for permission. They just called it Lubuntu, and just and we just they just went for it. You know, um, <laughs> in, in in one of the early blog posts, they they admit that they are not part of the Ubuntu family, though they take the name right. And uh, it doesn't even use any of the Ubuntu infrastructure. They just copy it all, build their thing, throw LXDE at the time on yep. the top, and then it's, they call it a day. Just there it is. It's Lubuntu. And I was going to give you, like, the version of LXDE, but that doesn't actually, that's not, like, a thing in that. Yeah, not not until later. Right, because LXDE is made up of a bunch of different parts, and each of those parts are pretty independent, and LXDE really is just the name for the umbrella that contains all these parts. Right. But it doesn't itself have a version at this time. Um, so, like, I figure you interact with LX Panel. A lot, which is, you know, the menu and the, yeah, where the clock the goes. And, right, like you see that, first boot, you see that. That was version 0.5.3. And all of these, all of the Buntus uh, were shipped with kernel, .2, uh, kernel 2.6.32. May 10, Unity is announced as a lightweight netbook interface aimed at Ubuntu 10.10. .10. May 26th. The Ubuntu and Canonical sites get a facelift. Uh, I figure if you're on YouTube, it's like here now. But uh, if you're not, uh, there's a link in the show notes. You can click to see what the Ubuntu site looked like after the facelift. Um, June 23rd, Unity shows a lot of improvement, but they want you to know it's not a dock. No. No. The mm. thing over to the left that looks like a dock, not a dock. Not a dock. You can dock things there. Not a dock, though. You can see it in action. There's a video on Vimeo uh, that, you know, one of the early days, you can actually see how it works. It's really kind of cool. Uh, the icons are pretty easy to find. They're pretty massive off to the side. Mm -hmm. You know, you can yep. see them. Running applications are always visible. The focused application is easily accessible and touch friendly, which gives you the impression that they might be looking for, I don't know, convergence? Yeah. <laughs> just, just a little bit. Just a little bit. A little wink, wink. <laughs> yeah. July 7th, the Ubuntu font family beta. They weren't using the Ubuntu font up until this point. They didn't have that day one. That wasn't a priority back then. But it pretty much took shape around this time. October 10, Maverick Meerkat 10.10 .10 is released, sporting the new Ubuntu typeface. Oh, boy. Makes uh, Unity the default desktop in the netbook edition. And in UTC, so the timekeeping standard, right? Universal time. Maverick 10.10 .10 was released on 10.10.10 at... 10, 10, and 10 seconds. Wow. That's very precise. That's super precise. It actually was. Um, the, the, the email on the mailing list actually went out at exactly nice. this time. That, that was well done. Well played. Well done. 10, 10 on 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. Like 10. Neat. It's a 10. <laughs> uh, GIMP, which has been included in all the ISOs up until this point, vanishes due to the complexity of the software and the install size. Right, we're still trying to keep it CD size. Right. So we got to get rid of something. And I remember the controversy about this because everybody was like, "Well, I like GIMP," and then everybody was like, "Well, you just download it, so it's fine. You know, it's in the repository; it's no big deal." But there was still fervor. I'm amazed the amount of software they were able to include in a yeah. CD size thing anyway. Yep. It was because the images didn't have to be shipped in like 9K. Yeah. And so, you know, you saved like 20 megs right there. Easy. Mm -hmm. You just fit GIP in there. <laughs> no, I know. Yeah. It's cool. So GIMP is gone. Uh, but Pativi, the video editor, which is still around today and still being actively developed. Yep, it is. Showed up. Huh. The open source Nuvo, I think that's how you say that, is yeah. used by default now. 
uh, still in in its infancy, and I say that right, but I mean it was it was still pretty good back then. Mm-hmm. Um, and the proprietary driver, if you wanted to install it after the initial install, was way better than it used to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, kernel two point six point thirty five is what all these shipped with. Hey, do you want to have a topic covered or have some feedback? You can send us an email. Contact mm-hmm. at linuxuserspace.show. March seventh, quitter talk. Not not quitting Ubuntu, but um, <laughs> quitting a window? You don't need to quit, Leo. I guess that's true, right? Like, I mean, it all stays in memory anyway. It's not like we just dump that memory when we're done. Well, I mean, you do that on these devices, right? You just kind of, they, they, they stay running. That's the idea. You don't do it on phones. Why do you do it on desktop? And this is an idea that... that has been floated around a lot. I think GNOME a few years back yeah. came came into that, right? It's why app indicators yep. isn't a thing. Nope. Uh, and elementary OS even has uh, latched on to the idea as well. So I think there was a lot of times that Ubuntu is just before their time, at least on the desktop anyway. Yeah, certain things are are, you know, obviously pushed a little bit. I think, as far as pushing the envelope. And March 9th, Netbook Edition will be rolled back into main Ubuntu for 11.04. Uh, April 5th, here's where we finally get to be sad. The quote, It's with some regret that we are announcing the end of the Ship It program and the CD distributor program. CDs were still being made available to locos, but... Mm. Mm. Pretty much done that's, with. That's, that, that was it. Pretty much after that, I don't remember seeing one of those beyond that personally. Um, no, and, I want to. I, I want to. Like, I would pay to get yeah. at least the LTSs with with the cover art and the sleeve and the... Just, yeah. I mean, I paid for Mandrake in a box once. I know. I mean, I'll, I, I'll do it again. I bought Red Hat <laughs> once, so there you go. Yeah. Like, before it was Enterprise. Like, it was... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. April 28th, Natty Narwhal 1104 is released. The website got a makeover. Uh, again, probably here on the video, but uh, if you're listening audio only, click on the linky link right under there to see it. Uh, 1104 marks the switch to Unity as the uh, default. Mm-hmm. And everybody's collective head explodes because everybody hates Unity so much. It really wasn't like that. I think it was, at the time, if you read the people that were writing about Linux and Ubuntu in general, um, you'll see that it's it's more, ooh, it's different. I don't know if I like this. It's different, and you know, it's not GNOME anymore, and I, I'm not sure how this is going to work out. But... By and large, I think the the people that were uh, looked up to, I guess, is maybe the the term I want to use, um, didn't hate it. They just were apprehensive about it. Um, and GNOME was still around, right? But it was renamed to GNOME Classic, and it was an option to choose on login. And while we know the Netbook Edition was being rolled into the main project, the release notes mention changes to Ubuntu Netbook image for ARM, which comes with a new Unity 2D desktop. So they were still using this Netbook thing as uh, as a test bed for how Unity is going to shape up. Yeah, so the 2D thing was like without Compiz. Right, right. And Rhythmbox, out. Banshee, in mm. um I, I just have a thing about rhythm box, so I had to report on it. That's that's why it's there. <laughs> mm-hmm. And the addition, so like the Ubuntu Netbook addition, we're just dropping addition. That's no more. We're we're doing we're done with that. Addition is no more. Uh kernel 2.6.38.2 is what's shipping on pretty much all of that. Uh, June 2nd, the option to get an Asus EPC preloaded with Ubuntu is available. It also comes with Adobe Flash pre-installed because YouTube. Well, that was the thing, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Uh, these these were little teeny netbooks, if you will, and uh, boy, were there a lot of them produced. Holy cow. I, I have one. I still have one. You still one. have one? Okay. Uh-huh, from about 2010-ish, and it still runs. 
It's got a spinning disc in it, so it doesn't run fast. But, I don't. I, mean, I don't think any of them were very fast, but um, they were not. They they worked. I want to say mine had a Centrino. Yeah, Centrino. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't like know. A, if... It was a underpowered CPU of some sort. Yeah. Uh, July thirteenth. Uh, we we just had to define what Ubuntu Orange was, and that's uh in hex. That's DD four eight one four, and Aubergine, which I don't think ever changed, is seven seven two nine five three. Yeah. Um, I, I do have a link later on down in the show notes where the orange the changes. Current, yeah. Yeah, where the orange changes, but I don't think the Aubergine. Changes. I don't think there Aubergine. There are other. There are other Aubergines. But yeah, no, I don't think Aubergine. I don't think Aubergine be... does change. No, I don't think so. No. Anyway, October 13, Oneric, I think, Ocelot, 11.10 is released. Unity still, but now based on GNOME, dot, GNOME 3. Ooh. But GNOME is missing. Poof. The netbook based Unity 2D is now the fallback. So GNOME out, Unity in. Unity 3D, Unity 2D. You just take your pick. It doesn't really matter, but you're going to be on Unity no matter what. Uh, and as you might have guessed, earlier in the year, GNOME moved to version 3. GNOME 3.2 was in the Ubuntu repositories if you felt so inclined to install it. And uh, just like the uh, the the starting of Unity, uh, this, mm, maybe you liked it and maybe you didn't. It was, it was really different. Really different. Lubuntu. It's official now yeah. using <laughs> Ubuntu backend and everything. So yep. no more no more clandestine backroom conversations about what Lubuntu should be. It's all out in the open. It's Ubuntu style. So Lubuntu is official. But TV, remember? Yeah, it made it a year and it's out. Mm. It's gone. Not on the ISO anymore. You can still get it, but it ain't it ain't there anymore. But, so in reality, most people don't need probably a video editor. Well, this, I mean, certainly not at that day and age. Yeah, true, I guess. Uh, I guess video recorders were just now starting to really catch on. Mm -hmm. um, and the duplicity graphical front end Deja Dupe was added for backups, which still, if I'm not mistaken... Deja Dupe's around, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's and still, still there. The thing, yeah. And a new Ubuntu Core, no, not that Ubuntu Core, mm. is available for creating custom images. Uh, all this based on kernel 3.0.4. October 21, it's announced the upcoming LTS 12.04 will have five years support for the desktop too. So not just the server, which had five years for quite a few yep. years at this point, but the desktop is getting five years too. And so it's just this whole five-year LTS ecosystem, and that's yeah. kind of where we're at today. It is. 2012, January 24th, the HUD is mm. introduced. And, okay, so... Do you know kind of like what K-Runner is, where you type it in and it just kind of, you know, figures that out? Well, it's kind of like that, but also think about it like this. You're in an application and you know that there's like, think GIMP, right? And there's this filter that you know that you want, but you forget. It's like eight menus deep and you don't remember what it is. The HUD in Ubuntu in Unity would allow you to open it up and type in like, well, I want this specific blur you just type in G-A-U-S, and it's like, oh, here it is. You click on it, boom, in the app, it's like as if you went through the 17 different menu iterations to get there, yeah. and it immediately launched up. This is probably the coolest feature of Unity ever. Yeah. I, I don't know that there's anything like it anywhere. I don't think so. Like, yeah, you're right. K-Runner, probably the closest but even that doesn't really drill down like this did and it doesn't do this no it does not do this um certainly not within the application that you're running um nope. definitely not so way is, more general it's a true heads-up display just like it says and it's still good like even in more recent versions of unity it still still does some of those things so it's yeah, super neat because Windows 7 was around, and I had very much gotten used to hitting mm -hmm. the start button for stuff and yeah, then just typing what I wanted. It, yeah. And, like, the HUD will do that, too, if you're not running any applications. It'll search through your system. It'll search through your files. You know, like all of the other, you know, launchers and whatnot do. But this takes it a step further and actually yep. 
integrates with the application as you're running it. Yep, nothing else like it that that I've ever seen, and it was fantastic. Because how many times have you been in that situation where it's like, mm-hmm. oh, I know it's somewhere here, I don't know where it is. Like think like like Office or Excel, where there's oh, so yeah. many things that like you know generally they exist, but you don't know where they are um, unless you use them all the time, right? This is this is really where the HUD excelled, and it was a fantastic feature then. I, I still long for the day where I can have a feature like it today, mm-hmm. but it just doesn't exist. April 26, Precise Pangolin 1204 is released with the HUD, the heads-up display. Mono, the .NET compatible framework, shows up, still in use today. Banshee out, Rhythmbox in. I told you about Rhythmbox, wow. I know. It's, Man, it's we went back, back and, and forth there, yeah. Yeah, go back to the last episode, I'm not a fan. But whatever, just get Amberall. And you're good to go. Uh, and and here's where it shifts, right? Like, so we saw a, a Unity come out and we saw people be very apprehensive about it. But this is really where favorability for Unity starts to shift. The HUD is amazing and just generally fine. Mm-hmm. It's, it's good stuff. Anyway, the traditional installer live CD is dead. We went on to DVDs. We, we, let's... Yes. Put all the things in there, including yeah, the kitchen what I, sink. What I mean by that <laughs> is the 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 images, the ISO images are no longer 695 megabytes. You know, mm-hmm. the maximum CD size is 700 megs. And, you know, the images up until this point have been constrained to that size. Right. But now, eh, 900 megs, whatever. People have DVDs, DVD burners now, whatever. We're not making CDs anymore anyway. Just Make open a DVD. it up. Yeah. And they continually grow up to this point. Like, they're like two gigs now. <laughs> but but this is when it started. And, of course, uh, kernel 3.2.14 is what all this is running on. But this is the very first release, LTS, by the way, that had the hardware enablement stack, which would give you the newer kernel features in a long-term support release, which historically up to this point had not changed. Right. So... This is good stuff. New features, but hopefully yeah. no regressions, I, right? I, I, they'd probably done like patching, but like not to this magnitude. Right, right. Backports, but not new features. Right. And that was that was really what this is about. And you ended up with, by the end of uh, Precise's lifetime, you ended up with kernel 3.13, which is a lot of iterations. Yeah, it is. I mean, kind of what you're looking at today, right? I mean, we make some pretty big leaps and bounds with uh, hardware enablement now. February 10, Ubuntu Business Desktop Remix, which is the only time I ever heard about this, but it existed based on 12.04. Never again. Didn't hear. Yeah. Yeah, no, I I read through the same things and I never saw it again. (laughs) I mean, it was there. Briefly. It was a thing. Briefly. They announced it. Yeah. Then in October 18, Quantal Quetzal 12.10. Quetzal or Quetzal, depending on your pronunciation, was released and is the first version to support Secure Boot. Mm. Yay, because Windows 8 and Secure Boot and all of that. Mm -hmm. But some flavors like Kubuntu missed out this time and had to wait for the next release. But they got it eventually, too. The first Ubuntu GNOME remix, because... I mean, Mate's got to start somewhere, right? Uh, Release with GNOME 3.6. So nobody's using GNOME 2 anymore. Mate's, you know, the the wheels are turning Mm -hmm. right about now. Uh, Actually, in 2011. um, But GNOME 3 is the thing. So just got to forge ahead. Uh, CDs are gone for good. Um, And as we mentioned before, it's just the CDR is not big enough anymore. And the Amazon search thing. Remember that? Where you clicked on the dash and it opened up and you typed in something and front and center you had Amazon results. Mm. Mm. Yep. Not great. This was the first time that I fully put my foot down and was like, all right, Ubuntu, that's too much. Um, Because even back then I was a bit of a privacy hawk and I'm like, hmm. I mean, Nobody to wants get Amazon products results. pushing their face, right? I mean, that's right. essentially what was happening. You know, well, and you know, but but the thing but, is that that Mark Shuttleworth wanted a a you know a display that would show you absolutely everything. You typed something in, mm-hmm. 
And you didn't have to search for it. You didn't have to go to a web page. You didn't have to go to Google. You didn't have to do any of that. You just typed it in. The thing you wanted showed right up. Right. I think the goal was to get that, yes. But right. they, they started with Amazon, so you got product and, shoved in your face. <laughs> yep. And you started with a group of nerds. It, it wasn't well received. It was not. Not at all. Mm. Not at all. So, I mean, that happened. ZDNet reported on it. Mm. You had uh, Mark Shuttleworth kind of defending it. You had the EFF, the, the you know, Privacy Hawk extraordinaires coming out and weighing in on this and saying that's too much. So it just was not great. Mm -mm. Um. And later on, you could disable it, but you had to get pretty nitty gritty at this time to be able to turn it off. So not great. But kernel 3.5.5, and then we fast forward to 2013. People are still mad about it. January 2nd, though, Ubuntu comes to the phone. This was why 12, uh, 12.10 and the Amazon thing existed yeah. to get ready for the phone. Right. Because this is literally... What you if you if you have an iPhone you swipe down and you, there's nothing on the screen you swipe down, literally what happens, and nobody cares. Right. But well, Ubuntu hey, did it in front of a bunch of nerds and it's it's big news. I, I know the Kindle is an Amazon device, but um, hello, there's ads on those. They're Amazon well, ads too, right? Yeah, but you could you could pay extra. You gotta you pay can extra. Pay for extra it. for it, but <laughs> you gotta pay you gotta pay for it though, right? Give me, I'll pay an extra 30 bucks to not see the Amazon results on my dash. Well, that's just it. You're <laughs> paying for it in the ad or you're paying for it in, you know, uh, uh, money up front. Those right. are your choices. I mean, so it's to fair. Ubuntu's credit though, to Ubuntu's credit though, it was proxied through Ubuntu. So there mm -hmm. wasn't any personal information that was whatever, but still, you know, it you still rubs you the wrong <laughs> <laughs> right. So these phones uh, were targeted at uh, both uh, entry-level devices and high-end super phones. I'll mention a couple of those phones later, but, I mean, they were ahead of their time with the whole well, edge gesture thing. See, I, I said it before, Ubuntu keeps doing these things way too early. Mm -hmm. They had the right idea, and everything that they've done is pretty much standard now, but they did it too early. And the edge thing. Like, you did not have, like, bottom edge and, like, for a long time, you didn't have side edge action mm -hmm. on most yep. of the phones. Now, iOS has all of those things. Android has most, if not all of those things. I haven't used much Android lately. But, <laughs> um, like, all of these things that Mark was debuting back in 2013 are now the standard, but just too early. Too early. April 25th, Raring Ringtail 1304 is released with Unity 7 and a renewed focus on mobile ahead of the 1404 release. So, I mean, we're going full on with the phone thing. So mm -hmm. you, you're going to kind of see the desktop slow down a little bit and the mobile ramp up a little bit. And you'll see another shift mm, a little down the line. Anyway, Wooby, mm. near and dear to my heart, gets the axe. It's gone. Uh, Windows 8. Introduced so many incompatibilities, and there were other bugs, like it just didn't create a user account, which is kind of important. Yeah. And and Wooby's gone. Just done. Ubuntu Chillin' is born now, and all of this stuff based on kernel 3.8.8. .8. Now, here's where Ubuntu really goes for it. Ubuntu Edge is announced. This is a phone, a device, that will blur the lines between desktop and mobile, huh? Convergence, convergence? is happening. We said the word. It, it, you said the word convergence. Everybody wanted convergence right at this point. This was the big buzzword, and Ubuntu was again first to market. Well, I don't know about first to market, but they were early Yeah. with this. And we're going to see what happens, but it doesn't happen yet. August 21st, first. Uh, by the way, Ubuntu Edge was announced as a Kickstarter or a Indiegogo. I think it was on Indiegogo, but it was, you know, Kickstarter. Yeah, right, th right. those things, yeah. Bloomberg backs the project. I think the their backing was like 100 grand or something. It was a lot of money. It was a lot of money, but, you know, they, they were in the millions of what they needed to actually meet the goal. 
and it fails. I think they needed like 30 million. They only got 10 million. So they were pretty far off the mark and it just never made it to market. The the device never existed. And this was something that I was watching because, you know, I had the, the Android little flippy thing mm-hmm. with the keyboard and everything. And I'm like, well, oh, that yeah. would be kind of cool to have just one device for everything. And yeah, no kidding. Never happened. Sad times. October 17th, Saucy Salamander 13.10 is released. And up to this point, LTS release or non LTS releases were supported for 18 months. But now, cut down to nine. And I think this is a good thing. It's too much development time. Yeah. You know, dealing with the non LTS releases. And I think Ubuntu is seeing that they need to focus on mobile. They've been focusing on the server. And there's. You think about the possibility of the number of releases that you could have to support yeah. if you were doing Ooh. 18 months? No. Nope. Not good. Too much. Yeah. Too much. There's an ARM64 port making it even harder and a port for phones making it even harder, uh, but they looked ahead to Unity 8 and the inclusion of click packages yep. mm-hmm. and targeting the Galaxy Nexus and the Nexus 4 among a few other images. And, you know, there were people that were running Nexus 4s like up to a few years ago. So that was a good device. Mm -hmm. Um, And this release would have included the Mir display server if I had one. Well, you know, technical difficulties, multi-monitor setups are blowing things up. So just kept it out. More difficulties arose when Ubuntu wanted to change the default browser to Chromium, But that didn't pan out, and Firefox stayed the default and just kind of stayed the default. Mm -hmm. Smart scopes were added to allow searching the web through the Unity Dash, right? So in Mark's rebuttal to the Amazon thing, it was like, well, Amazon's just where we started, but we want to make, like, the whole web. Ubuntu wanted to become Google. Well, you just didn't have to go to Google anymore. But... Anyway, more things were added to the dash. You could do more web searches. It found more things that you wanted. But criticism. The the sting of Amazon never went away. And yeah, that one burned. Criticism, mm-mm, criticism all across the board. Uh, but still, that year, Linux Journal readers voted it the best desktop distribution of 2013. Hmm. All that based on kernel 3.11. November-ish, I couldn't figure out when this actually happened, but November-ish of 2013 saw a trademark dispute between Micah Lee, formerly of the Freedom of the Press Foundation, the EFF, and the original maintainer of the HTTPS Everywhere project, um, between Micah Lee and Ubuntu, when Ubuntu was made aware of the site fixubuntu.com, which centered around Amazon and searching in the Dash. Um, And now it uh, that that particular website, don't go there. It just sent you to like this weird aggregator site. You mm-hmm. know, the sites. Mm-hmm. Uh, the site made use of the Ubuntu logo, the Ubuntu fonts, and not only criticized Ubuntu for its search within the dash, but it showed how to disable it, which I think that part, good thing. Legal sounding emails and letters were sent to Micah and that uh, Shuttleworth eventually apologized for. So he said, he said, Someone at Canonical sent out that email, and he called it a mistake. The EFF, again, wrote about all the confusion, and both Micah and the EFF basically said, that's not how trademarks work, so no. (laughs) Anyway, in 2014, Ubuntu Chillin' on February 14th hits 1.3 million downloads. Extremely popular Mm -hmm. in China. Yeah. Wow. That is a lot. And in April 2nd, Ubuntu One's file services are being shut down. So mm. all that two gigs of free storage? Poof. Not, not, no, not quite yet, but it's more like, you know, download all your stuff before it goes poof because mm. it's going poof. And yeah, just get your stuff out of there. Sad times. It was sad times. I remember it being a pretty great service, honestly. Yep, and I think, you know, generally 14.04, which came out on April 17th, was was a very, very good release, but it was kind of soured because of the Ubuntu One thing going into it. That was right. two weeks prior to the release of Trusty Tar 14.04 on April 17th, which focused on technical debt on the desktop side and mobile interfaces on the mobile side. So, you know, we're still full on on the mobile thing. 
And while reporting on Ubuntu wasn't exciting, obviously, the general consensus was that Ubuntu was listening to the users and making incremental improvements. Mir, which was supposed to land, didn't. And Xorg, again. But trim by default. Yay, SSDs. Yeah. And GNOME 3.10 is installed by default again. Hmm. Interesting. Kernel 3.13 with hardware enablement support. So, you know, you got newer kernels and things like that. June 10th, Ubuntu Mate Remix is announced. Yeah, we couldn't do without GNOME 2 mm -hmm. on Ubuntu anymore. So Ubuntu Mate Remix is announced based on 14.04, already migrating builds to 14.10 for testing. Martin Wimpress learns that Mubuntu, I'm so glad they didn't name it that, not only had been used before, back in 2012, I mentioned it up there, but I didn't call it by name, um, but that uh, even if he wanted to call it Mubuntu, Ubuntu protects the Ubuntu suffix. So you, no one else, no one, no one can use letter Ubuntu, you know, no more... No more Z Ubuntu or, you know, right. A, A Ubuntu. Not, none of that. Just that's done. We're done with that. So it becomes Ubuntu Mate. July 31st, Ubuntu 1, done. It is done. Hope you got your data because it ain't there anymore. All deleted. Yeah. One, one more thing about Ubuntu 1. It's, it's, it was really, I'd say it was a great service because it was very integrated into the desktop. Um, think of things like OneDrive and the way that integrates into a Microsoft machine, like it does yep. the syncing and like, you know, your files are very accessible. And Again, way before I know, I know. it's time. It was just too soon. Yeah, too soon. Speaking of too soon, <laughs> October 21st, Brian Quigley considers a proposal for 1604 which will be in a couple of years, to be the last LTS with 32-bit architecture support. It eventually fades away because everybody kind of enjoys 32-bit support. <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot of pushback on that one. Uh-uh, not yet. Keep this in mind. It's coming back. Yeah, well, two years is a long ways out, so nobody really raised a fuss <laughs> then. <laughs> right. October 23rd, Utopic Unicorn 14.10 is released as the 10th anniversary release, one of my favorites, mostly because of the mascot, but also because I'm continuously running Ubuntu at this point, to little fanfare. There's really not a whole lot of changes because, again, the focus is on mobile, incremental mm -hmm. desktop you know, improvements, but we're focusing on mobile. And Mir misses its target again. Another promise, Mir will be there, but it didn't happen. And Unity 8 was actually supposed to be released as well on Utopic, but did not happen. Kernel 3.16 is what runs all that in the background. And then on December 9, Mark Shuttleworth announces Snappy Ubuntu. I actually watched the, the, like the YouTube video that they put out about this, and I was really excited about it. Uh, sna the Snappy Ecosystem for Cloud, where all software would be transactional, isolated, the first snappy image was Docker, which gives transactional isolated images. So Inception-y. It's kind of cool, though. It yeah, actually yeah, yeah, really it is. Yeah, it was cool. Like, looking back now, knowing what I know now, looking back then, man, this was good. A little before its time. But this one is one that didn't really quite fade away. It just changed its name a little bit. Anyway. 2015, I told you I wouldn't go too far into the server thing, but it's still, I still like it. It's cool. Uh, <laughs> 2015, February 6th, the BQ Aquarius E4.5 Ubuntu edition is available. So the first phone that ships with Ubuntu Touch, Ubuntu Phone, I still couldn't get it quite a lock on what they were actually calling it, but I think it was Ubuntu Phone, and then it eventually became Ubuntu Touch. But anyway... February 25th, Snappy Ubuntu Core. I finally got a lock on it. It's the full thing. It's all the things. People were just shorthanding it on Raspberry Pi 2. 
So you could really add Snappy Ubuntu Core, put OpenStack on it, add it to like this fleet of other Raspberry Pis, which is why Raspberry Pi is out of Raspberry Pis, by the way, mm -hmm. because everybody uses them for like appliances that nobody ever touches for years. And Snappy was the whole point of you don't have to touch it because we'll update it for you and you stay secure and you just get your features and we'll take care of the rest. So February 25th is really what started this Raspberry Pi in the background revolution. Right. And there were other things as well, but I mean, specifically to Ubuntu, that's what started it. April 23rd, Vivid Vervet 1504 is released with a splash of purple. There's more purple now. Yep. And uh, a, another small incremental upgrade, just like is you, uh, just like Utopic was, if you don't count System D. But that's not really a desktop thing, because the user session itself. Okay, here's here's the way that it worked. The system started with System D, but then handed it over to Upstart to deal with the desktop and all of the user land stuff. So it was kind of a yeah, half in, half out situation. They're both there. Right. But it started a trend. Mm -hmm. And the first release to add LXD. Dan, you know a little something about LXD, I, I, I guess. I do. I, I use LXD containers. Um, and so they're, they are. They're containers. They're like Think Docker, but this is a, they're the Linux container. Halfway between a VM and a container. Yeah, more more container, but um, certainly share some things with VMs. Later iterations will you you can actually do LXD VMs, which are different as well. So, Mir and Unity eight miss again, mm. and we're we're gonna. I mean, what, what, uh, how many times you read that so far? A lot, <laughs> yeah, a <I> lot. <laughs> but the only reason I'm reading it is because they announced it I know, would be there. I know. I know. And then it wasn't. Yep. On the other side, on the graphical side, AMD GPU was a thing. It became a thing in cooperation with AMD, who acquired ATI, remember back then? Mm -hmm. um, but upgrade issues from 1504, if the older FGLRX driver isn't removed first, it would just, mm. you don't have a graphical session. Guess what? No graphical session. None. Ubuntu Mate. Nearly called him Ubuntu gets his first official flavor release. It was a remix before. Now it's official. Ubuntu Mate on kernel 3.19. And Mate was running 1.8.2. <laughs> May 4th, in a Q&A prior to the 2015 Ubuntu Online Summit, Mark Shuttleworth announces that Unity 8 is going to miss 16.04 too. Mm. It's going to be an option. You can test it. But it's not going to be default. It's not ready for prime time. July 20th, the Meizu MX4 Ubuntu Edition is available for direct purchase. It was available before, but now just any old person can go get one. You have to like sign up and get approved to be a developer or whatever. But now you can just go get one. August 3rd, Snapcraft. Finally, we get to like what? Words that I think people that use Snap know now. Uh, Snapcraft yeah. is announced, and Snappy apps are still called like there's still the Snappy thing, mm -hmm. but Snappy apps are now being referred to as just Snaps. August tenth, Ubuntu one is dead. We know this, but the code lives on. The back end is now open source, so if you want to build yourself a cloud-based solution based on the code of Ubuntu 1. You can do that because it's open source. Go for it. I don't know that anything did, but you could. Well, August you, 14th. But just to interject, certain, certainly you wouldn't probably now because you'd build something like NextCloud or something like that, right? Yeah, I think, right. And they have a client. You could just integrate yeah. it and it works everywhere no matter what. So, yeah. October 22, Wiley Werewolf 15.10 is released and another version that hasn't changed much. Outside of a slightly color-shifted wallpaper, we've kind of gotten used to this by this point, scroll bars that don't disappear, and a bit of instability. Mm. On the server, though, lots of cloud-based OpenStack improvements. I promise that's all I'll say about the server on this release. Kernel 4.2 on this one. 
2016, February 18th. ZFS is coming to Ubuntu. It's licensed with the CDDL and not GPL. Is it legal? The lawyers say it is. So, yeah, it's coming. Um, I remember there was this whole thing between Oracle and yep. the people that use and ZFS and yep. can you do it? And Canonical came out and was like, you know what? But let's put it to rest. The lawyers said it's cool. We're going so to do it. it. Yeah, we're we're going to do, do it. it. I mean, don't use it if you don't want to, you know, be part of this, but we're doing it. Mm -hmm. April 18, the Aquarius M10, a full PC in a tablet body is available. This is the full convergence idea where you have this massive 10-inch mm -hmm. tablet or whatever it is. You plug it into a monitor, mouse, keyboard, mm -hmm. and you got a whole desktop. It's cool. What's not to love? That sounds cool. We'll we'll see what's not to love in a minute, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, April 21st, Xenial Xerus 1604 is released. Is Xerus a goat? I don't know. I, I lost track. I was going to tell you when the goats were here. Uh, I think tr Tar, Trusty Tar was a goat. Uh, yeah. Um, is Xerus a goat? I don't know. I, I don't know which either. ones are the goats. Anyway, I don't have any Xeruses in the backyard, so I couldn't really tell you if it's a goat or not. Anyway, uh, Ubuntu 8 finally lands, but not by default. Uh, ZFS support is also added. Snap package support is introduced. So Snappy, Snapcore, Snappity, Snap, Snip, Snip, Snap is here. It's actually here. It's in there. use it. And, you know, the whole Snap story where it's like developers can, you know, super fast give you your updates and stuff. It's really taking root now. And... Ubuntu software is dropped in favor of GNOME software. The Dash has online searches disabled by default. The EFF finally got through to them. Um, again, it was just too early. It's fine now. In 2022, you can totally do that kind of thing. It's fine. It's mm -hmm. totally fine. Yep. But not in 20 not, anything. No. 21, no, nothing. Uh -uh. Kernel 4.4. Sad times. April 26th, the Ubuntu Orange changes. You were alluding to this, Dan. It's mm -hmm. different now. Hex is E95420. And light aubergine, which is not which is different than aubergine. Aubergine stayed the same. Right. Light aubergine, which is the customer facing aubergine, is 77216F. I don't know if you're just gonna open up GIMP and punch those numbers in to see exactly what they are, or I don't know. You could click on the link in the show notes and see what they are. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, they're, they're there. <laughs> you could totally punch in the hex numbers though. You could totally do that. Go for it. Yeah, knock yourself out. Um, yep. July sixth, acknowledgement that snaps don't quite look right a lot of times. Wait a minute. What are you talking about? They look perfect every time, Dan. What do you mean? <laughs> nope. The mouse is weird. The theme is weird. The colors are weird. The dark mode's not respected. Nobody knows what's going on. I don't know either. But they're working on it. So hang tight. July 14th, breach on the Ubuntu forums. Whoopsie. Oof. The attacker got a copy of the database, hashed single sign-on strings, and IP addresses for about 2 million users. So with enough effort, maybe you could spoof a single sign-on session but probably not and it's not like passwords were disclosed or anything but you're still encouraged and all that kind of yeah. good stuff so you know right october 13th yakety yak don't talk back no 16.10 <laughs> no <laughs> is really <laughs> user sessions are system d now leaving upstart behind it's it's done there's no user session, nothing. It's just all system D now. It's over. Don't start up, start. Y nope. Unity 7 is on life support, maintenance only. So bug fixes, but that's about it. Unity 8 is included on the ISO, but still not default. So what does that mean? Unity 7 is on life support. Unity 8 is not default. What does that mean? You'll see mm. in the next two years. October 20th, live kernel patching is available for 16.04. This is fantastic. I think Red Hat had had something for a little while at this point, but now Ubuntu has it as well. You do not need to reboot between kernel installs. Nice. The next day, 
Brian Quigley proposes 1604 as the last LTS with 32-bit support. I told you he wouldn't let it go. He's not letting it go, and he proposed it again. <sighs> Doesn't quite happen, though. November 3rd, Ubuntu Core 16 using Snaps is released for IoT. I was talking about the Raspberry Pi 2. This is really kind of the capstone to all of that. Now it becomes a really full-featured flavor that everybody can use and put on any device that accepts Ubuntu Core 16. Mm -hmm. And then you can just manage it with snaps. Really cool stuff. 2017, March 14th, a month before 1204 will lose general support, extended security maintenance is announced for Ubuntu Advantage customers, which mm -hmm. means you pay a little extra money, you still get some support. You're not going to get like new features or anything like that, but they'll make sure that you're not hit by those crazy big bugs that, you know, CVE this and that yeah, come out. Yeah. Big vulnerabilities, you'll, you'll, you'll get patches for those. You'll get that, but not much else. And you're still encouraged to move it on up. Move yeah. move it on up. April 5th, Shuttleworth announces that Ubuntu Unity's experiment has failed. Ooh. I said it would come. And no, not Unity 8 will be the default session in Ubuntu 18.04. This also marks the end of Ubuntu Phone. The next day, though, April 6th, Marius Gripsgard of UbiPorts stepped up to take the reins of Ubuntu Phone. And at this point, it's all handled by UbiPorts. And still that way today. Yeah. April 13th, Zesty Zappis. We ran out of letters. You, you wondered what we were going to do. We, we just started over. But, you know, we, we we're at Z now, or Z, depending on which part of the world you're listening to me mm -hmm. on. Yep. 1704 is released. 32-bit power PC? Dead. Swap file instead of swap partition? Kind of cool. Mm -hmm. Driverless printing? Makes things a little easier if your printer supports it. Ubuntu Budgie is born. All wrapped up with a kernel 4.10. July 11th, Ubuntu 1604 shows up in the Windows Store with Windows Subsystem for Linux. 2016. I did not I know it was know. that old. That's a little older than I expected. Wow. October 19th, Artful Aardvark 17.10 is released. We just started over. We just we took the alphabet and we just started all the way over. Yep. Unity rides again into the sunset, though. This oh. will be the last release with Unity. Python 2 is no longer installed by default. It's a long time coming. Python 3 has been out for forever. But, yeah. you know, a conservative release like Ubuntu, it took a while. Wayland is the default display server on supported systems, which were very few, admittedly. But it was the default. So Wayland, back in 26, 17, 17. Whatever yeah. our hard mark is, yeah. I've lost track. It's been a lot of history. So October far. of 2017. Ubuntu GNOME is discontinued in preparation for 1804, and no more having to figure out Control Alt F what for the desktop. It's just TTY one now. Control Alt F one. I'd say that's a fix because I couldn't ever remember if it was seven or what. Yeah, but, right. Yeah, on the server, I, again, I'll keep it toned down. Subiquity is released so this is that orangey black and green installer that you kind of yeah, you know, make a, your way through it's a bit of an enhancement over the regular debian installer if you will i like it i yeah. like it a lot mm -hmm. kernel 4.13 is what all of that lives on november 1st canonical joins the gnome foundation advisory board ahead of the 1804 release and on the 9th of november a call to help with ubuntu's default theme to land in 1804 March 19th, Firefox is a snap, but a little too early to call it default. April 2016, oh, by the way, that was Mozilla themselves were building the snap, so they were right. they were in it to win it from the beginning. Mm -hmm. April 26th is Bionic Beaver, 1804. The community theme isn't quite finished in time, and Ambiance gets one last shot. Gnome is the default at 328. X is the default display server again with Wayland as an option. Didn't quite work out that last time. The minimal install is now an option, which removes all the cruft that gets added on during the install. So you have just a nice, neat, you know, terminal, couple things. That's about it. Install. And the era of Snap as a default begins. 
the calculator, the characters app, logs, and system monitor are snapped by default. Click on the calculator, wait eight seconds, you finally get a calculator. Yeah. I remember. Mm -hmm. Pepperidge Farm remembers. Mm -hmm. All on kernel 4.15. May 19th, Brian Quigley looks to drop 32-bit hardware support again. 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 But, but, nothing yet. Right? Mm -hmm. July 13th-ish, the community theme or community theme is renamed to Yaru. Mm. September 21st, Mir 1.0 is released, but not really for the desktop. It's all IoT, and it all uses Wayland. Hey, Mir's not dead, and Unity's not dead. Kind of cool. October 18th, Cosmic Cuttlefish 18.10 is released. Uh, Yaru and its icon theme Suru make their debut. Speed improvements thanks to the GNOME devs. Improvements to Snap Startup Speed 2, but not quite enough. 32-bit support is now in consideration to be removed, so upgrades to 18.04 are forbidden. So Brian Quigley almost gets exactly what he wants, but not quite yet. Raspberry Pi 3 and 3B Plus are supported. Kernel 4.18 is what all of this is on. Yeah, a little side note for Lubuntu. This was the first release of Lubuntu with LXQt replacing <gasps> LXDE. Also, that's where I started contributing. So there you oh, go. Oh. Yeah. So we can blame you for all of that. Okay. Well, right. no, but. <laughs> <laughs> 2019. April 18th, Disco Dingo 1904 is released. The no mod set option, for those of you that use NVIDIA hardware, you probably know what this is, via a safe graphics mode is now available by default in Grub for graphical troubleshooting. Kernel 5.0, no more 32-bit ISOs. It's happening. Mm. But long live 32-bit. May 6th, with WSL2 out there, Ubuntu needed to be one of the first to have full support, and they did. May 28th, the Ubuntu Security Podcast is born with Alex Murray. We mentioned that podcast a few yep. episodes ago. Go check it out. Still going strong. Alex Murray's still the head. Mm -hmm. It's good stuff. It is good stuff. June 18th, i386 architecture. And I call it this because it's what it's called in the mailing list and everything else, but we normally call it 32-bit support, will be dropped starting with 19.10. Brian Quigley finally gets his wish until six days later. <laughs> <laughs> you might remember this. Well, it was a, the, six days later, but like a weekend in there too, so. Yeah. yeah. I-386 architecture will not be dropped starting with 19.10 with gamers, wine, Ubuntu, valves, power combined. They are don't kill 32-bit support. But there will come a time when the end is nigh. That's just not right now. So huge backlash, even though I, I saw some of the articles where um, canonical folks were like, we even talked to Steam and they were like, it's cool. And then they did it. And then Steam was like, well, now no. we're dropping Ubuntu support. <laughs> a little miscommunication there, I guess. Mm -hmm. October 18th. Uh, I still don't know how to pronounce this. Eowyn? Yo Eowyn? E Eowyn? Owen. Eowyn? E that one. Ermine 19.10 is released. I I don't even know if Ermine is a goat or not, but it is it not might a goat. Be. It's actually Oh good. It, it, it's not. It's more like a mink. I don't know if you've ever seen a mink. Good. Very, okay. Very similar I, to that. Okay. There are more goats. There's like three or four goats here, but not this one. All right. Not cool. this one. Nope. Experimental ZFS support on installation is available. So ZFS on root. USB disks now appear on the dock. Chromium is snap only. The NVIDIA driver is now provided on the ISO. The Pi 2 and 4 pick up support all on kernel 5.3. 2020, April 21st, Ubuntu in pop culture. I have this one in there because it was just really fun to watch. Um, it just It's like a list of all the different times Ubuntu shows up in like pop culture, mm -hmm. in TV, and you know all yeah. that kind of fun Out stuff. Out in the wild. So, yeah, go click on it. It's kind of cool. April 23rd, Focal Fossa 20.04 is released. I know this one's not a goat. Uh, no, absolutely. No, 
<laughs> Hardware enablement is on by default on the desktop. No need for GNOME tweaks to change the Yaru theme from light to dark. The spinny Ubuntu circle that we see today on the boot splash, which integrates in with like the manufacturer's logo is there. Yep. XFAT support by default, a little tweaking, but it's in the kernel there. The Snap Store tags in for Ubuntu software. Python 2 is just gone now. There's there's just yeah, no if more. You want it, you gotta yeah. you gotta do work. Kernel 5.4 is what all of that lives on. Then Groovy Gorilla. Uh-huh. This yeah, one that, that guy. right here on the shirt. Sorry, audio listeners, I was popping the shirt. Anyway, Groovy Gorilla 20.10 is released on October 22nd. Active Directory support gets added to the installer. Desktop images for the Raspberry Pi 4, which is, again, how I got the shirt. Kernel 5.8, November 2nd. Raspberry Pi 400 gets Ubuntu support. Just a nice little addition. December 16th, Snap gets faster with a switch to LZO compression from XZ. Like, I've, I've wanted to really enjoy Snap up until this point, but it's been slow to start and a lot of rough edges around here and there, but <laughs> the LZO uh, compression really kind of sped that up. And with Chromium, you see an almost 60% speed improvement. So, fantastic stuff. December 31st, another lurch forward for Snap theming, an automated service to notify Snaps of a theme change and install the theme if it's missing, and that works fairly well. 2021, February 1st, the Ubuntu installer is being rewritten in Flutter and should land in 2204. April 22nd, Hirsute Hippo 2104 is released. GNOME 40 was planned, but 3.38 won out. Wayland is the default unless you're on NVIDIA. Pipewire is enabled, which allows screen recording from sandboxed apps. Private home directories lands. Instead of 755, so like globally readable, it's 750, which means that you at least have to be in the group right. to read this stuff. And all based on kernel 5.11. October 14th, Impish Indri 21.10 is released. Firefox uh, follows Chromium and switches from a deb to a snap. Mm -mm -mm. Only for main Ubuntu. Not the flavors just yet. Mm -mm. GNOME 40 finally lands, and the workspaces are horizontal now. And if you look out on the internet right about now, you'll realize some people like it and some people do not. Mm -hmm -hmm. Like a lot. Like right. a lot. NVIDIA gets Wayland support, finally. And ZSTD, or Z standard compression, was enabled in the repository, which makes updates faster in general. Kernel 5.13 is what all that's based on. October 28th, the Raspberry Pi Zero 2W gets impish support. And finally, 2022, we've made it to this year at least. It's been a long journey. Thank you for staying with me so long. Ooh. Wow. I told you it was going to be long episodes ago. I didn't expect it to be this long, but it's long. Anyway, let's finish this out. March 16th, Ubuntu gets their shiny new logo, the little ribbon thing with yeah. the circles and the still circle of friends, but a little different. April 21st, Jammy Jellyfish 2204 is released with a new installer, better Active Directory integration. GNOME 42 is available, but Ubuntu opts for 41 with a mix of apps on 42. So it's kind of a little mix there. And some key backported features like triple buffering, which speeds up some animations on certain hardware. Flavors follow main Ubuntu and switch to the Snap on Firefox. So snap all the way if you're using Firefox, all based on kernel 5.15. May 26, a big push to improve Firefox Snap performance. And on July 8th, which is about a week prior to this recording, the push to improve Firefox continues and the average cold start time. So you just booted up, you just clicked on Firefox, six seconds on modern hardware. Raspberry Pi 4 clocking in at about 17 seconds, but they're not done yet. There's more improvement to be had. October 22nd, in the future, Kinetic Kudu 22.10 <laughs> is probably going to be released. Okay, that's, that's like the targeted release date. It might be different, yeah. but, you know, 
you'll listen they, to this before that happens, so I'll totally be right, and you won't even think to check. Yeah, yeah, real good likelihood on that, actually, because they've hit the mark on all the previous ones, other than 606. Yep. All right, you want to read Linux news that matters as it unfolds? Uh, head on over to our subreddit or our news channel on Discord. Uh, linuxuserspace.show slash reddit or linuxuserspace.show slash discord to catch those and you can also catch us on telegram and matrix uh, linuxuserspace.show slash whatever you're looking for and you'll find us all right Ubuntu is a pretty good platform. I mean, we know it's not going to blow up in your hands, but Dan, give me a quick rundown of, because this episode is a million years long already, <laughs> Yeah, how did it go for you? Well, I, I'm going to say it went great, right? Because it did. Like, it just works. That 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 is cliche, I know. However, it's it's a go-to for me. It's very comfortable for me uh, for obvious reasons i guess but um the amount of hardware that ubuntu supports and the way it works um is amazing honestly because there's a lot of other distributions that maybe you can't say that now i know sometimes newer hardware isn't quite um supported yet i mean that was a thing with video cards for a while but i think that's getting better um amd is getting their their stuff in the kernel sooner before they release the the, the things so it's it's becoming less of an issue i i know like around 2004 was a real problem but yeah i feel like it's better now no it it, it really is i think um i mean it I haven't bought hardware in a while for obvious reasons, right, especially graphics cards, <laughs> right? Um, but yeah, I felt the pain in 2004 mm -hmm. uh, where the kernel just wasn't up to snuff for the 5700 XT. And I had to either use an interim release or, you know, grab a kernel while, you know, the graphics were right. fine. Um, but, you know, it, it got to a usable state. But now like in 2004. Like the 6000 series stuff was in the kernel before the cards got released. So, yeah. so you know, by the time it rolled out into the release of Ubuntu, it was ready to go. Like yeah. you, you could have had the hardware and it still would have worked. Yep. Absolutely. So, so I have a, a huge comfort level. I, I use it on the server at work. Um, contribute to the Lubuntu team. Um, it's 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 you know main Ubuntu is is probably a go to for a few different things. Some of the tools that it that it comes with is is kind of great for setting up workstations and stuff for our team at work. So I'm I'm really comfortable with that too. I know it's GNOME, not my favorite, but um, the underpinnings are all the same. So I'm good with that. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, modern hardware running modern GNOME is pretty good anyway. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I think at this point, GNOME runs fairly well. Yeah. Little choppy on a fifth gen i5, but, I mean, it's way better. The triple buffering really oh, kind of smoothed out a lot of the stuff mm -hmm. that I was complaining about prior to this. I mean, it's still there. Triple buffering is not a magic silver bullet, but right. it does make it a whole lot more responsive. It's a whole so. lot less choppy. So... You know that that's good stuff in general, and you know I think one of the big reasons that we didn't talk about this distribution in season one or season two is because there's a lot of bias here. Huh. Like I think huge by you me. Know, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I I live on an Ubuntu base here at home. I use Linux Mint for the for pretty much most everything. Um, I I teach Ubuntu servers, so I deal with it all mm. of the time. I encourage folks. Um, that if they're just getting started out in Linux to, you know, start out with Ubuntu, because I think there's a lot of familiar familiarity there. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of the apps, you know, the, the the conversation of like Flatpak and Snap and stuff like that doesn't come up when we... We, we know with, it, with, but like not the, not everybody knows that, right? Right. I mean, yeah. they're just looking for Spotify. So mm -hmm. what, what, how do they care? Why, right. why do they care when they click on the thing? It's a snap. Like later on, they'll learn this and maybe then they will have an right. opinion on it. But 
you know, right now, no. And personally, I, I think Snap really kind of filled the need. So one of the things about uh, the last thing that we talked about was the the improvements in Firefox, mm-hmm. and that's real. It, like, it is real. I have been a the the only real thing that I that I have against Snaps. There's two things. There's one is a startup time on a lot of the apps, and two is sometimes the theme is off, and sometimes right. you get that janky little mouse cursor. What whatever. It's not a big deal. It's not a deal breaker. I was able to get 99 percent of everything that I wanted through Snaps. I was not off put, especially these la- this last week on. Uh, Ubuntu proper no. launching Firefox cold start. It was six seconds. Yeah, a lot better. A lot better. That's hardly slower yeah. than just running it as a deb. It took like four seconds, three four, seconds, four three, seconds as a deb. I didn't even notice it. Two seconds, you wouldn't really probably. I mean, I guess, right? right? And so huge leaps and bounds in Snap on the graphical side. There's still some mm-hmm. applications, Bitwarden. Mm-hmm. It, t- it took a while. Right. Well, and that's that's up to the application, how they want to, what compression they're using on that. Right. Not right. all of and them have switched. It, it, it's available, but not all of them have switched. Right. And so it's not always just the fault of Snap. Uh, there's a lot of things that can be done to speed those things right. up. So, you know, th- this is not an indictment of, of Ubuntu or Snaps or the ecosystem or anything like that. It is getting better. And I am hugely proud of them for for working on that. I mean, Ubuntu is really the only ecosystem, I guess I could say, that really uses Snaps as a default. Like you get it right. in Manjaro, but not by default. You got to go turn it on and right. you know, then you can use Bar or something like that to maybe enable them. So it's really just kind of Ubuntu and they're in their own uh kind of ecosystem but they're making it better. Yeah. And Firefox is a testament to that from I think the first time I launched it from the very beginning of the month that we started using it, it took about 13 seconds. And after this recent thing, it's about six seconds. So there's there really is a whole lot of work going into it. And I think it's just going to get better and better. It's their technology. And so why wouldn't why shouldn't they push to to innovate it and, and make it better and include it why wouldn't they include it it's theirs i mean they did that they did that with unity and then everybody hated them when it when it went away and it wasn't available anymore (laughs) so if we took snaps away right now and and they weren't available what kind of hate would they get out of that they'd be like oh look at that they threw it away again right but i guess the ultimate point to that is you can't please everybody no you can't it's it's impossible yeah, so I guess overall, I mean, the the only real knock I have against uh, Ubuntu this go around is that GNOME puts most of their like new cool software in Flatpak, mm-hmm. in FlatHub. Mm-hmm. So I had to add Flatpak and FlatHub to the install to be able to use things that you know I was talking about last episode. Amberall, right. I couldn't get Amberall any other way. It was Flatpak and FlatHub or nothing. So. You know, I'd like for that software to show up in Snap so I don't have to do those kinds of things. So one thing we didn't talk about was the, well, we did mention it, but not really talk about was not all of, it, it wasn't the complete stack, if you will, of, of GNOME 42, right? Well, yeah, we it, mentioned it just kind of, it's 41, 42, kind of half and little, half. A little it's, mix. Um, I did install some of the new GTK4 applications and yeah. um, they're looking pretty good. Lib Adwaita gets a gets a lot of heat as well, um, but I think um, the consistency is there at that point. So it's addressing some of those things. Yeah, it really is. the 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 terminal changes colors depending oh, on context. I love I that. Love That's, that. It's amazing. I, I I want that to be my my main terminal, but there's some features that are missing from yeah. it. It's still in beta. They're still working on it, so it's right. not like those features aren't going to land. But it's going to be a little bit before I can really use it as my daily driver just yet. But Overall, I mean, it's it's been a pretty fantastic. It's it's been an Ubuntu experience. It's been what you have expected from yeah. Ubuntu for a very long time. Extremely solid. Extremely solid. Yeah. All right. Um, I think that's bringing us to the end of the show. This this show does end, right? It, uh, it did. It, oh, please. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. So please come back in two weeks and we'll have a topic episode and probably not go for four hours. 
Uh, yeah, no, we're not doing that. Not doing that again. So in two weeks, we'll have a topic show. Um, Leo and I kind of bantered about, and I think we got an exciting one starting to get lined up even before we get there. So that's great. It's coming. Um, but in four weeks, the big distro that we're going to be trying, Endeavor OS. Woo! So they just- The the history, the history is only like three years long. I I think it'll be a short show. (laughs) It is. Well- Yes, but we get to talk more about the distro itself in our experience. Uh, yeah, I think so. So I think so. That'll be the the main focus, I believe. And they recently had a release, um, another a new release, not too long ago. So that that should be good. We'd be able to talk about that. So stay tuned and tell us things on Reddit, Twitter, Mastodon, Telegram, Matrix, Discord, whatever. However you do it, join the conversation. All the links in the show notes and on linuxuserspace.show. We thank you for your support. Um, you can always contribute if you love the show, which we think you do. Um, linuxuserspace.show slash Patreon. So, Leo, uh, where can we find you on the internet? Uh, you can find me at Leo Chavez on Twitter. And you can find me at casey 2 bz <laughs>so the confession Mm -hmm. uh never go in this hard ever again on a history ever just no (laughs) it it consumed me it consumed me like i I don't know what was it i know i saw that i was trying to fill in what i thought would be good stuff um, yeah, no, it was good. It was good. Uh, I figured since I was going to be reading over it anyway, I reworded some of it. But the, I mean, the, totally. The, yeah, no. And, the uh, bits were good. There was so much to read. I didn't. I yeah. Didn't know which thing to add. Which, you know, which thing is more valuable than the other? Because you obviously have to throw some of it out. There's just way too much.